perform experiments who um, perform experiments on peas in his garden and develop theories on mechanisms for inheritance several decades before chromosomes are even observed under microscopes. He chose peas because they're available in many varieties, as you can see on the screen. They differ by flower color, seed color, um, seed and pod shape, and a lot of other traits. Peas also have a short generation time and a large number of offspring for each mating. And they were especially easy to breed become, because Mendel just had to dust the pollen grains from one plant onto another. There are three important takeaways from Mendel's pea experiments, uh, the three laws that you see here, the law of dominance, law of segregation, and law of independent assortment. Here are the definitions, and I'm about to go over them separately. So first is the law of dominance, which is pretty straightforward. Alleles are either relatively dominant or recessive to each other. Uh, if you don't know what an allele is, it's a version of a gene. Here you see two of them, big A and little a. When you have a heterozygote like the um, big A, little a P you see on the right, then the dominant allele is the only one that's going to be expressed in a phenotype. Something to remember is that even though we most commonly use examples where there's only two versions of the allele, uh, like in this case, there can be any number of alleles, alleles greater than two. Therefore, a single allele can be dominant over one, but recessive to another. So uh, Mendel developed the law of segregation after observing that when he crossed two heterozygous individuals, he would get a ratio of three to one uh, for the phenotypes in the resulting offspring. Each parent is a diploid and they each contribute one of their two alleles so this creates a diploid offspring with one of four combination of these alleles. For each of the parents you see in the picture, the big L and the little L alleles separate during meiosis into different gametes, which are then paired with either the big L or little L of the other parent. As a result, you get three different possible genotypes and two different phenotypes from this combination of parents. Uh, next, we have the law of independent assortment. So Mendel derived the law of segregation by only following a single character at a time, such as flower color or a pod shape. Uh, for this one, uh, you have to derive it by following two or more characters at a time, such as seed color and seed shape. Uh, this increases your possible phenotypes from two to four. You can have yellow round peas, yellow wrinkled peas, green round peas, or green wrinkled peas. This is the law of independent assortment, and it states that every pair of alleles segregates independently of the, every other pair during gamete formation. So whether you have the green or yellow allele in one gamete, it doesn't affect whether or not you get a round or wrinkled pea in the same gamete. Every one of the 16 possible combinations from the dihybrid cross is equally likely to occur. Um, note that this doesn't mean you get four of every phenotype though, since the law of dominance still applies. So here are just some of the most basic ratios that you um, have to know. So the first um, picture is representative of how Mendel did most of his experiments. He started with two true breeding parents for different alleles, which means they're homozygous for either, in this case, the purple flower color or the white, uh, the purple allele or the white allele. Uh, when these two parents reproduce, they have a F1 generation composed entirely of heterozygous individuals. When the F1 generation reproduced to make the F2 generation, uh, there's a ratio of approximately three purple flowers for every white flower because some are homozygous for one of the alleles and others are heterozygous. And if you don't understand how this happens, you just draw a two by two Punnett square. Uh, this is the three to one ratio for monohybrid crosses. Uh, the other one is the nine to three to three to one ratio, which occurs with a dihybrid cross where you follow two traits. 
So if you take individuals who are both heterozygous for two different traits and cross them, you're going to end up with this ratio of phenotypes and offspring. In this, in this example, you can see how every individual can produce one of four types of gametes, each with equal probability, and they combine with one of the four gametes from the other parent. That's why you get 16 resulting combinations, and then you use the law of dominance to determine the phenotypes for each of them. In this case, you're going to end up with three round yellow peas, three round green peas, three wrinkled yellow peas, and one wrinkled green pea. So just take a moment to look over this um, Punnett square on the right. Okay, so not all relationships between genotype and phenotype are so straightforward, and there's a lot of exceptions to Mendelian genetics. Mendel recognized these limits when he tried to cross um, other, uh, when he tried to cross peas for different characteristics, or when he tried to do it with different plant species. Uh, for most of these, the basic principles of segregation and independent assortment still apply. So first, we'll consider the different degrees of dominance. In Mendel's peas, we saw complete dominance over, of one allele over the other, where you can't distinguish between the heterozygous and homozygous dominant phenotypes. There's another type called incomplete dominance, where the phenotype lies somewhere between the two parental varieties. So if you look at this, you'll see when crossing a red snapdragon flower with a white one, the resulting offspring is pink, which is an intermediate color. The third type is codominance, where the two alleles affect the phenotype in separate and distinguishable ways. Example of this includes seeing both red and white spots on flowers or with blood type, where you have uh, both the A and B alleles expressed with the AB blood type individual. So it's not only important to understand like what these phenotypes look like, but also how exactly the genotype affects the phenotype. So when a dominant allele coexists with a recessive allele, they don't actually interact. It's not like the dominant allele does something to the recessive one. And for this example, we're going to look at the round and wrinkled peas. The dominant allele codes for an enzyme that converts unbranched forms of starch to a branched form uh, in the seeds. The recessive allele codes for a defective form of the enzyme, uh, causing an accumulation of the unbranched starch. This leads to uh, this leads excess water to enter the seed through osmosis, and when the seed dries, it becomes uh, very wrinkled, as you can see on the screen. With heterozygotes, even just one dominant allele results in enough of the enzyme to synthesize the branched starch, which is why the homozygous and heterozygous phenotypes uh, both result in round seeds. So another interesting example is Tay-Sachs disease, which is an inherited disorder in infants. Uh, people who have this disease rarely live beyond the age of four. Uh, the brain cells of children can't metabolize certain liquids lipids when a crucial enzyme is not working properly. When these lipids accumulate in the brain, the child is going to suffer seizures, blindness, and degeneration of motor and mental performance. The interesting thing about this disease is that it qualifies as completely dominant, incompletely dominant, and co-dominant depending on what level you analyze it at. So at the organism level, the Tay-Sachs allele is simply recessive because only children who get two copies of the allele have the disease. However, the activity of the lipid metabolizing enzyme uh, is between that in people who are homozygous uh, for either the normal allele or the Tay-Sachs allele. Uh, this intermediate phenotype shows incomplete dominance at the biochemical level. And finally, at the molecular level, the normal allele and the Tay-Sachs allele are co-dominant because equal numbers of the normal and dysfunctional enzyme molecules are produced. Okay. 
Okay, so most genes exist in more than just two allelic forms. For example, the ABO blood groups in humans are determined by three alleles, uh, IA, IB, and lowercase i. A person's blood group may be A, B, AB, or O. The A and B represent two different types of carbohydrates that you might find on the surface of red blood cells. The blood groups show that you either have carbohydrate A, carbohydrate B, both of them, in which case you have type AB blood or none of them, which is type O. Uh, it's interesting to note here that even though O is uh, the least common in the Punnett square, it's the most abundant blood type in the world. You also have pleiotropy, where a single gene has multiple phenotypic effects. This can be seen in humans where alleles are responsible for multiple symptoms, uh, which causes diseases like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. And epistasis is an interesting exception for Mendel's mechanisms of inheritance. Uh, when this occurs, the expression of a gene at one locus alters that of a sec uh, of the gene at a second locus. So this, the most example, the most common example of this is Labrador retrievers. Uh, Labradors are either black, brown, or yellow, and there are two different loci that controls this coat color. Uh, for simplicity, we're just going to call them B and E. So if the dog has at least one of each dominant allele, capital B and capital E, then it's going to be black. If it has two recessive alleles at B, but at least one dominant allele at E, then it's going to be brown. However, if the dog has two recessive alleles at locus E, it's going to be yellow regardless of what the genotype at locus B is. You can see that on the chart, you don't have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio when you cross two heterozygous dogs, but instead you get a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio. And that's because the three and the one at the ends of the, the first ratio are going to be indistinguishable. So here's how this happens at the molecular level. The genes at locus B and E both affect eumelanin, which is the most common pigment found in mammals and gives humans like us our skin, the brown tone in our skin color. So in Labradors, the dominant allele at locus B produces black eumelanin, while the res res recessive allele produces brown eumelanin. That's why the dogs that are homozygous dominant and heterozygous both have black fur color, while the homozygous recessive ones have brown fur color. However, the gene at locus E controls whether or not the dog is able to produce any eumelanin at all. So if you're recessive for um, at locus E, you're not going to produce any pigment and the dog is going to appear light yellow. Um, it doesn't matter if the, if locus B tells it to produce black or brown pigment, it's not going to be able to. So, and this phenomenon is not unique to Labradors. The lack of pigmentation is something that affects a few select individuals all throughout the animal kingdom, and this is called albinism. You'll, you've probably seen this before, even in humans, where they're lacking pigmentation in the skin, hair, and eyes. Uh, they appear pretty pale overall because um, they lack another type of pigment called tyrosinase. And this is actually quite harmful because one of the pigments functions is to protect you from the sun's rays. And another interesting th thing to note is that um, this explains why um, there, some people are born with red hair. Um, it has to do with eumelanin 2. They can't convert the, um, a molecule into eumelanin, so the accumulation of that other substance is what creates the red hair color. So Mendel specifically chose traits that occur in two distinct variations. Uh, to study in order to make his conclusions. However, it's pretty clear that not all traits can be distinguished like this. Many are quantitative characters, which vary in uh, gradations along a continuum. 
So skin color, height, weight, and blood pressure are all examples of this. We see this is usually a result of polygenic inheritance where the added effects of two or more genes are going to affect a single phenotype. So take this example of skin color on the slide. So skin color may be determined by genes at three different loci and a person can be homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive at any one of them. The more recessive alleles that they have, the darker their skin color. And the more dominant alleles they have, the lighter their skin color. Uh, that's why you see the, the polar opposite at the two corners of the Punnett square. So I want to discuss linked genes here, which are incredibly important to understand and show up a lot. So remember the concept of independent assortment, where we assume that every pair of alleles distribute themselves into gametes regardless of how the other allele split. However, for this to be true, the genes have to be either located on different chromosomes or far apart on the same chromosome. Uh, if they're located far apart, um, they'll likely be um, split by crossing over. This is not always the case because linked genes are genes that are located near each other on the same chromosome and therefore tend to be inherited together in genetic crosses. So the most example famous example of this being studied is T.H. Morgan's famous experiment with fruit flies, uh, which I'll go over on the next slide. Uh, first, if you didn't know already, you should know that when I say wild type, I'm talking about the phenotype that you most commonly see in natural populations. So on the USABO and AP exams, you'll have a lot of questions that describe comparing mutants with wild types. And think of the wild type as sort, a sort of control. Also, uh, one last note is that sex-linked and linked genes are not the same thing because sex-linked genes are just the ones located on the X or Y chromosomes. So Morgan actually had multiple experiments using fruit flies, one of which did involve sex-linked genes. But the example here um, where I'm talking about the wing shape and body color, uh, those are for linked genes. So the wild type flies have gray bodies and normal sized wings. Morgan was able to obtain double immune flies with black bodies and vestigial wings. And the alleles for both of these um, are recessive to the ones in the wild type. Uh, neither one of them is located on a sex chromosome. When Morgan first crossed the wild type with the double immune, the F1 generation were all dihybrids. And then he made it a dihybrid female with a double immune male. And he expected to see an equal ratio of every combination of phenotypes. So one to one to one to one. Instead, he saw over 900 of the wild type and double immune phenotypes, but he saw only about 200 each of the gray vestigial and black normal offspring. Uh, this was a significantly greater proportion of offspring that matched either one of the parental phenotypes. And very few um, were examples of recombination occurring. So this implies that the genes tend to be inherited together more often than apart. And so it's not common that you see the genes separated um, by independent assortment or crossing over. That's why most of the offspring matched one of the parental phenotypes. So this allowed Morgan to conclude that the genes for body color and wing size are genetically linked on the same chromosome. And uh, here I wanna talk about pedigree analysis. Uh, since being able to read and inter interpret these is very important. I think in fact last year, a good chunk of the FRQs on the semifinal was on pedigrees alone. So pedigrees are the diagrams like the one you see above and describe the traits of parents and children across a family's generations. On the left, you have a key. So de definitely make sure you don't do things like mistaken two siblings as a married couple. And also I've never seen the symbol for carrier females used very often. So uh, if you didn't know, carrier females are heterozygous for recessive sex link traits that are inherited through the X chromosome. So they have one of the dominant allele and one of the recessive and are said to carry the gene because 
they don't usually show the symptoms but are able to pass it on to their children, especially sons. So a lot of times you'll just see characters, uh, carriers displayed the same as a unaffected individual. So timing on the exam is limited. So here's some tricks that might help you recognize the types of inheritance a lot faster. When you have an autosomal dominant disease, uh, autosomal meaning not on a sex chromosome, you'll notice that every affected individual has at least one affected parent. Uh, th this is because the phenotype is not going to mask or hide the existence of the dominant allele in either parent. Also, you have to imply that it's not sex linked because there's no significant difference between the number of males and females affected. So for this example, you see four males um, affected to two females. Um, this ratio doesn't go extreme enough for you to conclude that it's sex linked. Um, so notice here, person seven is unaffected. If this disease was autosomal recessive, then there would be no way that two parents who each have two recessive alleles could produce an offspring that somehow has a dominant allele and is unaffected. Oh, hold on. Okay, so um, next is the autosomal recessive. There are several giveaways. A very common occurrence you'll see is two unaffected parents uh, will produce an affected child. So this implies that the disease is autosomal recessive because for this to happen, both parents are heterozygous for the recessive allele and the ch child has a one fourth chance of becoming homozygous recessive. Uh, this is a case for individual 17 on this pedigree. So something else you'll see is that an affected parent crossed with an unaffected parent produces children who are all unaffected. Um, you can see that from person one and person two, they produce um, six, seven, and eight who are all unaffected. The most probable explanation for this is that the disease is autosomal recessive and the unaffected parent is homozygous dominant. So it would be very unlikely for um, an autosomal dominant disease. And finally, to make sure it's not sex linked, just check the proportion of males and females affected. And lastly, we'll get into some of the more unconventional ones. For sex link, like I mentioned earlier, you're gonna see usually a much greater number of males affected than females. Uh, so if the gene was on the Y chromosome, then obviously only males can have the disease because um, females don't have a Y chromosome. If the gene is on the X chromosome, males are still more likely to be affected because while females um, are able to be heterozygous carriers from having two X chromosomes. They need two affected alleles in order to be affected. Uh, while with males, you either have it or you don't because males only have one X chromosome. If they inherit even one from their father and mother, then they're going to have the disease. And the one on the right you, uh, is mitochondrial inheritance. So, uh, mitochondrial DNA is passed to children from the mother. So um, in every case of this, you'll see that if the mother is affected, then all of her children are affected. If the mother is unaffected, then none of her children will have the disease. So it's solely dependent on the mother. And you can see here, um, that's what's happening because um, the first mother who's affected both of her children are affected as well, and the pattern keeps going. Here I compiled a list of some of the most um, common genetic or chromosomal diseases and disorders to become familiar with. I already discussed Tay-Sachs disease, and there are a couple more down here that you might want to know the inheritance pattern of. And, but uh, it's not so important as to memorize these diseases as to know how to apply the principles of Mendelian inheritance. And a lot of problems you're gonna get have to do with math. So you need to know how to calculate probabilities or um, also analyze pedigrees. 
So um, on the next couple of slides, I um, compiled a lot of practice problems from either the Campbell textbook or past usable exams. I'm not gonna show them right now because I put the answers after every question slide, but feel free to go check it out when you have the time. And if you need uh, like very thoroughly written out uh, explanations, you can just um, put it into the Discord and we'll send it. So that's it for the lecture. And then uh, I have a Kahoot for you guys to play. So give me one sec to share that. So feel free to join now. Okay, I'm going to start the game now. Okay, so Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment applies during metaphase one because that's when the homologous chromosomes line up um, in the center of the cell and then they get split uh, separate ways. So it all depends on the orientation of the homologous pairs during this phase of meiosis.
Yeah, so this one is epistasis. I mentioned it during the lecture, but uh, red hair is caused by um, a lack of eumelanin because of epistasis. The gene that controls uh, what hair color you get um, is homozygous recessive, which is why you get uh, red hair and why it, also why it's very uncommon. Yeah, so um, for this one, you have to look back on the slide for the Tay-Sachs disease. So at the organism level, Tay-Sachs qualifies as recessive. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, at the, or, sorry, this might be wrong, actually. So sorry about that. Tay-Sachs disease is um, completely recessive at the organism level. So this should be false. Yeah, mostly you got this right. So attached earlobes are recessive, but they're a lot more uncommon than the dominant one. The other ones are all recessive. Uh, the other ones, uh, so let's see, the polydactyly, it's um, less common to have more than five fingers per hand or toe, but that's actually the recessive allele. Uh, Blue green European eyes are recessive, but they are more common and also dimples and freckles, uh, same thing. Yeah, so for Tay-Sachs disease at the biochemical level, it's incomplete dominance because you have an intermediate uh, activity level of the lipid metabolizing enzyme. Yeah, so this one is mitochondrial inheritance because uh, as you can see, every time uh, or every offspring matched its mother on the pedigree. Whenever you see like an entire road um, that's either like all affected or all unaffected, that's usually an indication of mitochondrial inheritance. Okay, great. Yeah, unless you got this right. So this is just memorization of the experiment. And if you look back, it was gray body and normal wings.
Okay, great. Um, so I'm mostly you got this wrong, but that's okay. I talked about you melanin a lot as the example for the Labrador retrievers, but I also mentioned that albinism, uh, it involves a different pigment called tyrosinase. Yeah, so these are all um, pigments that you might find in a person, but this is the one that specifically leads to the symptoms of albinism. Okay, uh, for this one, you have to do some quick thinking on the Punnett square combination. So you know that um, you know the genotype of the person with type AB blood, but for type B, you could either have two B alleles or one B and one um, lowercase i, which is O. So if you look at this, you can have AB if you take the B from the first person and A from the second. You can have type A if you have the O from the first person and A from the second, and type B if you have the O from the first person and B from the second. Type O is the only one here that's not possible because the person with AB blood can't contribute the O, the second O that you need for it. Yeah, so there were two answers here because uh, these are the two um, names of the, the syndrome. So uh, this phenomenon is called uniparental disomy, uh, where um, depending on which parent you get the alleles from, it's going to change the symptoms of the disorder you get. So with Angelman syndrome, um, it results in like an unusual facial experience appearance uh, like short stature and several intellectual disabilities. Um, this is when a baby inherits both copies of a section of chromosome 15 from the father. And um, contrary to that, the prater uh, Willy syndrome uh, is when the baby inherits both copies from the mother. And it has slightly different symptoms like poor muscle tone and weak cry, slow to feed, and they're going to appear under, undernourished. So this is a good um, syndrome to know. And it, it's an example that is most common for uniparental disomy. Okay, great job to all of you. Thanks so much for playing. And also thank you for coming to lectures and I hope to see you all uh, next week.